arrive at the terminal end of the motor. Okay, so, again, this is the muscles. The electrical signal comes in. This is the neuron. It releases a neurotransmitter from the end of these axon bulbs. Do you remember the name of the neurotransmitter? Acetylcholine. 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 That causes a signal to go down this little tube here and deep into the muscle fiber. Do you remember what the name of the tube is? T-tube. Yes, it's a T-tubule. Very good. There's this blue area here. Do you remember what that blue area is called? Myosin. No. Nope. Is sarcoplasmic, sarcoplasmic reticulum. That's the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And the sarcoplasmic reticulum holds a certain ion. Do you remember what that is? Calcium. Calcium. So this is all stuff we have to know to understand how this works. So as the calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which it shows here, whenever a nerve signal goes to your muscle, the calcium is released. The calcium goes in and it binds to a receptor protein called troponin that's on the actin filament. So there's the receptor molecule, troponin. It is caught in the calcium. The troponin is attached to this tropomyosin filament here. And when the calcium is received by the troponin, it and the tropomyosin move and expose myosin binding sites on the actin filament. Uh, this would be a great essay for the test. So the, that moves there, and now the myosin binding sites are exposed, and now the myosin cross bridge, that's what this is, can reach up and attach to the binding site and can pull. With the help of ATP, which is an energy molecule, it pulls, and here comes some ATP to let it release and pull again. And so this will go on in numerous places, causing the muscle to contract. And the filaments slide past one another so we call this the sliding filament theory of muscle contraction. So it's just now, hold on, when the signal quits coming, the calcium is released. And the binding sites get covered back up, and so the cross bridges can't attach. Watch, they try to attach, but they can't. Oh, I can't attach, oh. And then the whole thing slides back. Because the signal, when the signal is not coming anymore, the calcium is released. So the signal is not coming anymore, so the calcium is released. See, the calcium is released, and now this thing goes back to its original position where it was covering up the myosin binding sites. And now the cross bridge can't attach, and nothing to pull the filament, so it slides back to its original position. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. <coughs> and so they're just showing the whole thing in review here, a quick review. Signal comes in, goes down the T-tubules, calcium's released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. What's next, do you think? Binds to troponin. Yes, now you're getting it. Calcium binds to troponin. The troponin and tropomyosin move, exposing the myosin binding sites. The cross bridge is able to attach and pull, and with the help of ATP, it can do that. So what ends up happening here is your muscles use a lot of ATP to be able to contract. Wouldn't it be nice to have something in the muscles that provides ATP? What do we know? What organelle provides the ATP? The mitochondrion. Guess what? Muscles that have a lot of mitochondrions are white colored because mitochondrions are white. Have you ever eaten white meat? Do you like white meat or dark meat? Like dark. dark. Well, white meat is called white meat because it's got a lot of mitochondrions in it. That half of y'all missed that, but that was, that was a great comment. What are those around No, white meat has a lot of mitochondrions. And, and has the ability to keep working for a long period of time, like the like chicken breast is the breast muscle, which is a flight muscle that can go for hours and hours because it's got so, so many mitochondria. So dark meat. Just dark meat is on muscles that don't need as much um, ATP 
because they usually do a quick, fast, strong action that isn't necessarily done over and over. So why do they show this as the mitochondria is brown in the movie? Because there's not coloring in the same. What's the difference? What's red meat? Red meat has less mitochondria. Um, yeah, it's got. That's the normal color of the rest of the stuff. Which one's the the mitochondria tend to color things whiter, lighter, lighter colored than the rest of the stuff. Yeah? Which one's the healthiest meat? I don't know if either's healthier than one. So chicken wings or white meat? What's that? Chickens? Chicken wings. Chicken wings are dark. Are dark. Chicken, chicken breasts are white. So what's the other white meat? I don't know. What is the other white meat? Pork. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's the model. Of the guy. That's the commercial? Yeah, national. I've heard that on commercial pork association. Oh, the old NPA? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That's so <laughs> Alright, so now we're going to learn about hormones. You want to talk about hormones? So, what chapter are we on? Does anyone know? 40. 40? Section by section. We spend three days on this chapter. Do you like chapters better section by section? Yeah. Yes. Is everybody pretty in agreement on that? Yeah. Well, your quizzes don't show that. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I'm so mean. Um, the, uh, the hormones. See, a nerve signal is a way of communication that's very quick. My brain can communicate with my arm like that. I mean, literally, tenth of a second, I can command my arm to contract, and I can lift something up if I want to, or I can hit you. It might even be faster than that. Um, hormones are ways of communicating that are slow, or at least a lot slower than nerve signals, because they're chemicals that are released that travel somewhat slowly. For instance, they show the pancreas right here. It can release a chemical, a hormone, it's called insulin, and the insulin can go through the bloodstream and can end up in the liver. I mean, the insulin actually travels everywhere in the blood, but the liver is the thing that senses the insulin. So when the blood goes into the liver, the liver goes, oh, wait, there's insulin. And when the blood, when the liver receives the insulin, it tells the liver to start absorbing sugars from the blood. And the liver will take the sugar molecules out of the blood and store them. And it stores them as a big molecule. Do you all remember the name of the molecule in the liver that stores glucose? Glycogen. Glycogen, yeah. I wasn't expecting anyone to get that. I'm in so much of a better mood now. <laughs> That's it's called glycogen. That's what's wrong with me. Yeah, give us some more stuff like that. It's glycogen. So glycogen builds up in the liver from the liver storing sugars. So the pancreas is telling the liver to store sugars through a hormone called insulin. And so this is just another way of communicating. It's a little bit slower because it takes time to travel through the blood. But often it can last longer because those, those insulin molecules take a while to get out of your system. So the signal may be slower, but it may also last a little longer. And um, these molecules are very small. Insulin is a, is a protein that's, you know, you don't have to make a lot of a hormone to get the signal across. Um, so that's what we're studying, hormones. They are uh, produced by many different glands in your body. These are all the different glands that uh, produce hormones. Uh, let's go through them one by one here. Uh, the hypothalamus is a gland that's in your brain that squirts out some hormones. 
and those hormones tell the pituitary gland what to do. So it's interesting, the hypothalamus squirts hormones that are called releasing hormones. And it'll tell the pituitary gland, when it receives those hormones, the pituitary gland will send out hormones. The pituitary gland sends out a heck of a lot of hormones, and we're going to study these over the next three days. But we call it the master gland because of all of the hormones it produces. You can read what they are there on page 754. Antidiuretic hormone, oxytocin, thyroid stimulating hormone, adrenocorticotropic hormone, gonadotropic hormone, prolactin, growth hormone. We'll talk about all of those and what they do. How many are there that exist? Uh, there are seven of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, Hormones in total. Oh, total hormones? Oh, I, like 20. The thyroid gland, this is in your neck region, it squirts out three hormones, T4, T3, and calcitonin. The thyroid gland is in part responsible for your metabolism. Have you ever heard, oh, she's, she can eat whatever she wants, her metabolism is so high, I hate her. Y'all ever say stuff like that? <laughs> T4, T3, and what? Yeah, T4 and T3 are the, are the metabolism hormones. Uh, calcitonin, they're right there in your book, page 754. And they're right here on the board, too. Okay, um, what's next here? We got uh, the pineal gland. The pineal gland kind of sits in the back of your brain or the back of your brain stem, I guess we should say. Uh, the diencephalon is this area that contains the pineal gland. It, it releases, the pineal gland releases a hormone called melatonin. And that controls your sleep-wake cycle. Melatonin makes you tired. You, you all normally get tired, right? Around what, 11, 12 p.m., something like that, you start to get tired. That's because of the pineal gland and it's melatonin. On the back of the thyroid gland, behind it, are four little dots that look like beans. They're called the parathyroid glands. They help control your calcium levels, and we'll talk about them some more later. Your adrenal gland. These are your kidneys right here, and they look like little, they have what looks like little hats on top of them. What is this? These are the gland. adrenal glands. Have you ever heard of adrenaline? Mm -hmm. That's released by your adrenal glands. There are some others. They're on top of the kidney? Yep, they sit on top of the kidney right there. It's like, the, it's like a kidney hat. The kidney's got a little hat. That's <laughs> the adrenal gland. So if you get your... Oh, never mind. Um, anyway, the adrenal glands release uh, cortisol, aldosterone, epinephrine, which is adrenaline, and norepinephrine, which is called noradrenaline. And all of these are, are stress hormones. Do you feel stressed right now because of all the things that are going on in your life? The divorce, the mortgage, the, oh wait, <laughs> wait that's <laughs> Cheerleading tryouts, Mr. Willis's test. Anyway, all that stress is caused by the uh, the adrenal glands and the hormones they release. If you if your person is not stressed, maybe your adrenal glands aren't functioning right. Could be. The thymus gland is a gland that sits right up, kind of over your heart. And do you remember? That's where the T cells were produced. Matured. And matured, yeah. Actually, that's correct. They weren't produced there. They matured in the thymus gland. And the thymus produces a hormone called thymosin that helps them mature. Doesn't it disappear when you get older? It does. It disappears when you get older. So all of us have pretty much lost our thymus gland by now. Oh well. Did you enjoy it while you had it? Yeah. Really? At our age already? Yeah, at your age even, it's pretty much gone. It's really only active when you're a kid. So that it 
immune Yeah, your immune system is pretty much already made by the time it's where you are. You know, cavemen didn't live a whole lot longer than you will live, than you are now. They they died at age 25 or so. So all that had to be taken care of earlier. Um, what else do we got here? Your pancreas. Your pancreas produces insulin, which you've heard of, and glucagon, which you may not have heard of. But they kind of have opposite effects. Insulin causes sugar to be stored in your liver, and glucagon causes sugar to be released by your liver. So glucagon is just the opposite of insulin. Person who has diabetes has doesn't make insulin correctly. And it's usually because their immune cells have attacked the cells in the pancreas that make insulin. For some reason, as a child, or even I think it might even happen in the womb, the immune system says these cells are foreign and destroys part of your pancreas that produces insulin. And why that happens, nobody knows yet. Mine does. I had one diabetes. That's type 1 diabetes. Yeah. Type 2 diabetes is when your body stops responding to insulin. And that usually happens in older people who are obese, who have eaten so much sugar that insulin keeps being produced, and pretty soon the body goes, enough with the insulin. The liver's like, I'm, I'm, I'm ignoring the insulin. And so you stop being able to store sugars, and then the insulin stays in your blood, and your blood gets real thick, and you have kidney problems and heart problems trying to pump this thick blood around. That's what older people tend to get. And that's one of the reasons why you shouldn't eat too many sugars in your life. What about, what if you have too much of other ones, like glucagon? Glucagon. Like, what if you can't uh, produce them? If you don't produce glucagon, yeah. then you wouldn't be able to get the sugars out of your liver when you need them. So you'd have to be eating, constantly eating sugars a lot. I've never heard of that. I don't know if that's a, there's a disease of that. There probably is, but it's probably more rare. Finally, your gonads, those are your reproductive organs. And we talk about those next chapter. The testes and the ovaries. The testes produce a hormone that's called an androgen. Uh, that uh, gets your reproductive system working right for guys, and ovaries produce estrogens and progesterone that gets your reproductive systems working right for girls. And um, we will talk about those hormones next chapter and what they do. Okay. So you gotta wait for the, you gotta wait for the sex talk. I'm gonna give you a sex talk next chapter. It's not as interesting as you might think. To me, it's interesting. <laughs> so how do hormones work? Well, let's, let's watch. I have a video here showing that hormones are released and attached to receptors that are on the surface of the cell. And this is what the AP bio exam is interested in, is you understanding that cells have receptors that attach to things. You've, probably, you've already seen this in a lot of different scenarios. But here it is in the case of hormones. This is kind of a lame video, but we'll get to the good videos later. This was this video was made by like a five-year-old, it looks like. A circulating hormone secreted by an endocrine cell enters the bloodstream, which carries it to cells throughout the body. Only target cells with specific receptors react to the hormone. Okay, so these cells had the right receptors to react to that hormone. And a lot of cells do not. So only, so these, the, the, the cells with the, res, with the correct receptors are the only ones that react to the hormone. What were you going to say, EKF? I didn't hear it. I, I was asking what cell released it. Oh, some, some cell that secretes it probably from one of those endocrine glands that I just listed. So that could, this could be this could be a cell inside your pituitary gland, releasing the hormone, and the hormone spreads, and these cells receive it, and they do their thing based on 
what they're programmed to do when they receive that signal. Does, the, does like the reaction go back like into the blood? Or like what does it do? Well, what this cell does depends upon what kind of cell it is. Now, so that's what we're going to go over next, what the different cells do. Some cells then do something, some cells do nothing. For instance, like if that was growth hormone, and this cell received that signal, can you guess what this cell would do if that was growth hormone? It would multiply. It would multiply. So it's programmed that when this receives that signal, it multiplies. So that's what we're going to see next, how that programming works. And this is a diagram showing how that programming works. Here comes a hormone from the blood. This is a blood vessel. And the hormone can leak out of the blood vessel through cracks in the walls. Now, this hormone, they're, sh they're making it bigger than it actually is. Um, it would be a lot smaller if this were a blood vessel. But anyway, here's this hormone, and here's a receptor protein on the membrane of some cell. Can you tell that that's a membrane? Mm -hmm. uh, Phospholipid bilayer, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a protein on its surface. And here's the hormone, and does it look like it fits there? Yes. There's a, now, hormones are, uh, are usually, uh, when we say peptide hormones, do you remember polypeptide? Mm -hmm. Remember what a polypeptide is? A bond. It's a chain of A polypeptide is a protein, okay? So these peptide hormones consist of basically two amino acids joined by a peptide bond. That's a peptide hormone. A couple amino acids linked together. We call that a peptide hormone. That's small? It's that small. It's a protein and it leaks out of the blood. It's, it's two amino acids together and they take a certain shape. They leak out of the blood. Then they bind. So there they go. It's bound. Epinephrine binds to a receptor in the plasma membrane. So epinephrine is the hormone adrenaline. So this cell has received adrenaline. Ooh, what's it going to do? Well, then the next step, and you have to memorize these steps. I'm sorry. But the next step is this little protein here will then leave this piece, this protein is like a piece, and really this is better shown as a video, and I have a video here I'm going to show you with this. But this little protein here moves, you see, and attaches to this protein. What is that little purple thing? That little purple thing is... Uh, it's like a breakaway protein? It is, is, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a protein that breaks away from this one and binds to this one. And what this enzyme does is it forms this one, this enzyme here, this green one, when this thing connects there, it changes ATP to a new form called cyclic AMP. Now let's let's see what this is. Do y'all remember ATP? Adenosine. Adenosine. And I'll draw a little square here with three phosphates attached. Now what this enzyme's going to do is it's going to take ATP and it's going to change it to a molecule called cyclic AMP. Let me show you what cyclic AMP looks like. If we take two of these phosphates and remove them, then we're left I'll draw an arrow here so you can see the change. With adenosine in one phosphate. These two phosphates are removed. I'll put them way over here. We don't have to worry about them anymore. This molecule, we don't call ATP anymore. We call it AMP. Adenosine monophosphate. 
And that monophosphate actually has two bonds with the adenosine. It's bonded there and it's bonded there. And that's why we call it cyclic AMP. Because this kind of goes around in a circle here. There's a bond and a bond. And so it's bonded in a triangle, so it's cyclic. Anything that kind of ends up bonding to itself is known as a cyclic bond in organic chemistry. So what we've done is we've created a second messenger called cyclic AMP inside the cell. Cyclic AMP is called a second messenger. The first messenger was this peptide hormone that came in, adrenaline, or epinephrine is what we call it. Epinephrine is the scientific name. Adrenaline is a more general name. When, when it binds to the enzyme, is it protein and enzyme the same thing? Yes, an enzyme is a protein. Okay. A big protein. It's big. So when, it, when the orange one binds to the green one, it's just a piece of the orange one? This is or Are you saying this is orange? Yeah. That's purple. Yeah, purple. In, in my book. I, I, don't, I can't see colors. Green, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I'm so sorry. That, so it's just a piece of that? Yeah. Or is it a different okay. thing? It, it's actually, this protein right here is made up of a large protein and a smaller protein. And this smaller protein can physically move and it slides over here. After that hormone binds, this protein will slide over here and bind with this enzyme. And now this enzyme, we, we call an enzyme like this a coenzyme. Have you ever heard that word before? Yeah. So this enzyme has to get together with this enzyme to make a full enzyme. So here's this enzyme here, and there's its coenzyme. They get together, and now ATP can be changed to AMP. Okay? How does it just lose to phosphorus? Um, something, you know, you know, this enzyme is like, is like, kind of like hands that take something apart and put something together. So, when this thing binds here, it changes, it actually physically changes shape to a shape that pulls those phosphates off. Anyway, the cyclic AMP, will now activate what we call an enzyme cascade. So the cyclic AMP will attach to another enzyme that changes to another shape, and that will attach to another enzyme that changes to another shape. It's kind of like a domino effect. Have you heard of a domino effect? Again, when I was a kid, we used to line up dominoes. And Stephanie, if you knock this domino down on this end, you get dominoes continue to be knocked down. And what's interesting is, one cyclic AMP can activate many other enzymes. It can go activate this one, and then activate this one, and then activate this one, and then activate this one. It's kind of like in dominoes when we set them up. When you knock down dominoes, one domino can knock down two other ones if you set them up right. Have you ever seen a domino thing set up like this? Where one comes out, it knocks down several, and then the several go off. And now you have a whole bunch of different paths of dominoes being knocked down going off. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. You can look that up online. They have some incredible things. And anyway, so this enzyme cascade ends up causing inside the cell glycogen molecules, this is the big glycogen molecule, to be broken down into glucose. So basically what ended up happening here is when the peptide hormone epinephrine was bound, glucose was made inside, was, re was released inside the cell. And guess where those glucose will go? Guess where inside the cell the glucose will go? Oh, to the mitochondrion. And guess what the mitochondrion are going to do with the glucose? Which makes? ATP. It'll make ATP. Now you have ATP inside your cell. This is just ah! Oh my gosh. It just, <laughs> it just happened in you. It just happened in you. My whole body Your whole body reacting? Yeah. Adrenaline was released. It went, it went into your cells. ATP's being made. You're going to do it again. 
The cyclic AMP then binds to and activates a target protein, such as alpha kinase, which adds phosphates to specific proteins in the cell. The effect of this phosphorylation depends on the identity of the cell and the proteins that are phosphorylated. Okay, so in our book, it didn't tell us the name of that little protein that moved. It's called a G protein. And I have seen that on an AP test before, so that's probably important. You may want to label that. Let's go back. This little protein here, that's called a G protein because it goes. I just made that up. I don't know why it's called a G protein. But it goes and activates the enzyme that makes cyclic AMP. The cyclic AMP causes other things to happen. And in the video, it was showing that alpha kinase thing was one of the other enzymes that can be active. So even if it's not... Um even if not, you're not using epinephrine or adrenaline or whatever, mm -hmm. do all hormones make sugar? No, just epinephrine. Just epinephrine causes the sugar to be released. Okay. Every hormone has its own specific thing that it does. So uh, most of them use second messengers mm -hmm. like this, but the activity of the second messenger varies. And so that's why they aren't making you memorize what the second messenger does um, for everything, because it's different for every hormone. Okay. So that's all we need to know about? Well, this is the example they use in the book. So we don't know what we need to know? Specifically how the others work, no. I'm going to show you tomorrow what all the other hormones do, but we're not going to talk about what each second messenger is, or, you know, what each enzyme cascade is. Now, have you ever heard of a steroid? Uh -huh. Steroids. They travel in the blood attached to protein carriers. This is weird. It's not letting me When go. steroid hormones arrive at their target cells, they dissociate from their protein carriers and pass, pass through the plasma membrane. Okay. Steroid hormones work differently. Steroid hormones are based on fats, like cholesterol. Do y'all remember cholesterol is a fat? And since steroid hormones are fats, they don't have to bind to something on the membrane. Fats can go right through the membrane because the membrane is made of fats. So steroid hormones go